you have your Bibles or Testaments with you, we're turning to John's Gospel, chapter 19. The Gospel according to John, and the chapter 19. Verse 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. The Roman soldiers whipped him with a lash. And coming out from that lash, were pieces of bone, pieces of metal. And they flung it round in the air, two of them, one after the other, on the back of his neck, and dragged it down his back until it was like a ploughed feet. They scourged him Verse 2, And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns, not the wee thorns we have here, but the long Palestinian thorns, maybe an inch in length. And they put the crown on his head, and they put on him, or wrapped round him, a purple robe. Imagine, imagine his back lacerated in pieces and wrapping that old robe to mock him round his lovely back. And said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands or with their clenched fist. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns, and the purple robe. And Pilate saith unto them, Behold the man. When the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was more, he was the more, and note that, he's already afraid, but he's the more afraid now went again unto the judgment hall, into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus give him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivereth me unto thee hath a greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. 
But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. And Pilate therefore heard that saying. He brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in the place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover in about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold, your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. We know that God will bless to us the solemn reading and the solemn singing of his precious word to our hearts. There were three things in particular that caused Pilate to reject Christ and to capitulate to those that bade for my Savior's blood. Three things that made him the most infamous of all Roman governors, the best known of all. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John all speak of Pilate. So does Paul, so does Peter, and so do thousands of people every day in the great Apostles' Creed. But there are three things that Pilate can be remembered for. And the first one is this. And this is a very solemn meeting tonight. And we have been drawn already right through the meeting to the cross. And this is not the work of men. It is the work of God. And I pray that God, the Holy Spirit, will deal tonight as we come to these sacred verses with all our hearts, backsliders, sinners, believers. May we get a fresh vision of Calvary tonight. The first thing that I see about Pilate is Pilate's fear. Pilate's fear. It's written all over the story. In Mark 15 and 15, Mark says Pilate was willing to content the people and release Barabbas. But he delivered unto them Jesus. And I say to you tonight, the Word of God says that the fear of man bringeth a snare. The fear of man bringeth a snare. Pilate wasn't the worst of the Roman governors. He was not any way the worst man in the Scriptures. He wasn't in the same league as the Herods or the Caesars or the Neros. He knew in his heart what he should do, but he didn't do it. Just like you tonight in these meetings, you know in your heart what you need to do, but you haven't done it yet. And because of the fear of men, the devil tightened the snare round him until he strangled him with fear. 
And if Josephus, the secular historian, is correct, and he's correct in most things, Pilate died a suicidal death. When all this was over, and he was rejected later by Caesar the emperor, he plunged a knife right into his heart and died a suicidal death and went to a suicidal hell. Now, my dear friend, tonight, be careful how you handle these truths. Be very careful when we come to these solemn messages on the cross that you take heed that you don't do what Pilate has done. He ended up a tormented, suicidal man. I say to you tonight, don't let the fear of a husband or don't let the fear of a wife or of a boyfriend or of a girlfriend or of somebody at work take you to a lost hell. Don't do it. Don't do it. I knew a young man in the town of Listerski and his own, he was afraid of his own mother. His own mother was the greatest roadblock to him coming to Christ. And the brethren had meetings and they went on for 16 weeks. And in the last week, this young man who had been attending them came to Christ. He says, I can't fear my mother anymore, but I don't know what she'll say to me. And he came home and told his mother, from that day, his mother hardly spoke to him. He told, him, told me himself that he came home at night. He used to drink and he was wild. And he was at all sorts of things that he shouldn't have been at. And he used to come in drunk at night. And after he got saved, he'd pull back the bedclothes and the mother had put bottles of beer in under the bedclothes. What a rascal she was. Wouldn't you thought that it was good to see her son changed and saved and born again? Oh, my friend, the devil has many ways. And don't you let anybody keep you back tonight because of fear. Because fear is a great problem. George hit that the other night. Revelation 21 says that fear tops the list of men and women going into the lake of fire. It tells us that it's before the idolater, the fearful, and the unbeliever. It's above the, uh, the whoremonger, and the murderer, and the sorcerer. And you're none of those things tonight, I believe, in this meeting, but you're fearful. You're afraid of what they'll say at work. You're afraid of what they'll say at home. I don't know what you're afraid of, but the fear of man bringeth a snare. Or maybe like someone said to me not so long ago, I'm afraid I couldn't keep it if I got saved. It's not yours to keep. You do the coming and he'll do the keeping. Don't let that put you off. Oh, I don't want to be like these other hypocrites round about. There's a whole lot of them, and there's plenty of them about, dozens of them. Don't you let that boy keep you back. Don't let them keep you back. That's no excuse tonight to say that you're afraid that you'll not be able to keep it. My friend, he'll keep you. He has kept me by the power of God for 40 years and more. We're kept by the power of God. You just do the common tonight, and he will do the keeping. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Are you not afraid tonight? 
as you sit uh, under that anointed singing, as you, as you sit under the singing of the hymns of the cross, and now this message on the cross, are you not afraid tonight? Are you not afraid of judgment? Are you not afraid of hell? When it dawned on Pontius Pilate, the eternal issues that he was facing, it says that he was more afraid. He went into a spin. He says, what am I going to do? What are you going to do tonight? Hmm? What are you going to do tonight? Some of you here and you're backslidden. There's not a sign of the Lord. Oh, you made a profession, but there's nothing going. Nothing happening. It's a surprise you many believers in this meeting never, never spent a half an hour with the Lord today. What are you going to do about it? Are you content the way you are? Do you want to get back to the Lord again? Do you want to get back into the joy of God's great salvation again? What are you going to do about your sin tonight? Because it'll find you out. Billy Sunday says it's God's greatest detective of sin. Be sure your sin will find you out. He got more afraid. He says, what am I going to do? And with a heavy burdened heart, Pilate climbed up onto the throne at Gabbatha early in the morning. And I can't paint you a picture of this scene tonight. I'd love to be able to do it. But I trust that the Holy Spirit will do it. The rough, cruel Roman soldiers frog-marched the disfigured dismembered body of Christ before the judgment seat. Remember they had abused him and beaten him all night when the morning was come. All night, all night they abused my Savior. These wicked rough Roman soldiers cleared their throat and they spat, it says they spat, they spat, one after the other, spat in his face. They played the king game with him. When her sister was singing that, I, I just couldn't, I, I nearly fell off the seat. Calvary came fresh to me tonight sitting there. They played the king game with them. They blindfolded them. And with a clenched fist, they ran round and hit him. And they smote him on the face. Smote him on the side of the head. And says, tell us who smote you. If you're God, if you're a king, who smote you? The king game. The one that created all things. The one who, to whom the nations are but a drop of a bucket. The one who made the wandering seas and the hills and the mountains. The creator of all things. Been battered all night by cruel men. Tis love beyond compare. And now he's before Pilate. This pitiless, merciless crowd cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! And Pilate came out with this powerful statement. Underline it in your Bible. When he came in before the crowd, here's what he says, Behold the man. What a text. And I agree with an old brother and writer who said, he said, behold the man because he looked no more like a man 
just one blaze of flesh because his visage was marred more than any man. Behold the man. Oh, he's a man all right. He was the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He was the son of man and yet the son of God. He was the son of man as he slept in that ship on that boat across Galilee on a pillow. My Savior slept on a pillow. He was man because God never slumbers or sleeps. But then when the storm raged and the disciples cried, he got up and with one word he calmed the stormy sea. He was God, yet he was man. He went to the well of Saker's well one day and there was a woman who had five husbands. And as he sat weary on the well, he was weary. He was tired. God never tires. But he was the son of God and the son of man. He was the son of man as he sat hungry and weary on the well. But he could look into the heart of this woman and he could say, Thou hast had five husbands and the man that you're with is not your husband. He was God. He can look right into your heart tonight. And hold tight now. There's someone in the, some of you in this meeting tonight and you're fiddling about at night with pornography. And you get the wife away to bed. You're at that old filth. And he knows. He knows. And he's searching your heart tonight. And some of you believers, you're at it. And you'll need to flee from it. You want me to go down into the aisle, do you? I can't get any closer. It's not about wonder you can't pray. It's not about wonder you have no desire for, to read the Word. It's not a wonder you have no desire to witness. What are you going to do about it? Pilots fear. Secondly, we're Pilate's friend. A true friend loveth at all times. Listen, I'm your friend tonight. George is your friend tonight. This tent is your friend tonight. I may be harsh and I may be hard, but, but I'm your friend. And I prayed over you the day and I love you with all my heart. A true friend loveth at all times. The best friend that Pilate had that day apart from the Lord was his wife. All their friends were fickle. All their friends were fair weather friends. I've met a lot of them in 40 years. When the storm starts to blow, they run. But I have a good, faithful friend tonight in the Lord, and I have a good, faithful friend of 42 years and a wife. She's my best friend. And she's critical at times, and I need it. And I need it. When the enemy were beating him and the husband was scheming, she was dreaming. God came to her in an awesome dream during the night 
and what a night she spent and what a day she spent. And she jumped up and she sent for the servants and she scribbled the note. And on the note it tells for the attention of the governor immediately for his attention when the scene was going on, when he was on the judgment seat, when Christ was before him. God interrupted. He wants to stop him. He wants to hinder him. And here's what the note read. And I can almost see Pilate and he's shaking up and he's afraid of the crowd and he's afraid of Caesar and he's cornered. The man's cornered. Listen, sin will corner you. Young man, it'll corner you. Old pornography will corner you till it destroys you. Well, drugs will corner you till they'll destroy you, son. Shaking, he says this from his wife. Have thou nothing to do with this just man? And then in the Greek, here's what it reads. Have nothing to do between thee and him, that righteous man. I have suffered many things this day, this day. What a night and what a day she spent. What day she spent. I have suffered many things this day because of him. Now what Pilate's wife felt and what she saw, I don't know. But she had an encounter with God and God's using her as a barrier to stop him. You can't get much closer to him, more closer to a man than his wife. And if history again is correct, this changed this woman's life and she became a devout believer. But how sad, one saved and another lost. Maybe there's a wife in this meeting and you're not saved yet. And your husband's saved. You'll give a bit of a gasp some night and you'll be out into eternity separated forever. Isn't it awful? Isn't it awful that men and men and their wives come down through the years together? 30, 40, 50, I 60 years until they're tottering in old age and they've been so faithful to one another. And they've been through the storms and trials of families and homes and jobs and money and times when they were bad and they stuck together and they kept together. One saved and the other lost. And then suddenly, just in a moment, they're separated forever. How sad. You can't get much closer to a man than through his wife. Pilate, don't go on with it. Pilate, stop it. Pilate, don't worry what they say. Don't worry about Caesar at Rome. Don't worry about your job and don't worry about promotion and don't worry about these men. We'll start a new life together. Pilate, I love you. What turmoil this man must have been in. Must have been off. He wanted to content the people. Content the people, but you'll never content Christ. What an awful. Oh, what a friend she was. This woman was Pilate's roadblock to hell. This tent is your roadblock to hell. These prayer meetings is a road, your roadblock to hell. We can't do any more. We've stood the storm and the gale and the rain. 
All because of your soul. We're not here to start a church. We're not here to ask you to come to the light boat or any other church. We're here because you have a soul. What a friend. In the late 1970s, I was up at the front of the big Presbyterian church in Port Rush. I can never remember whether I was leading the meeting or whether I opened in prayer, but I knew I was in the pulpit. Because it was a Christian Police Association convention. And every seat in the belly of the church was full, and so was the great gallery. I, there could have been a thousand people in it. And the preacher that night was Walter Allen, the next head constable of the RUC. And I heard Allen preaching on a number of occasions, and every time I heard him preaching, he preached the same message. He preached on the coming of the Lord. Two shall be in the bed. One shall be taken and the other left. Two shall be grinding at the mill in the factory and suddenly Jesus will come. One shall be taken and the other left. Two shall be in the field. The man and the, and the farmer. And suddenly one shall be taken and the other left. And there came a hush over that meeting. And way down in the heart of that congregation was a wee family from Sion Mills. It was a mother and a father and two children. And just as he was preaching like that, one shall be taken and the other left. The wee girl of seven tugged her mammy's coat. And here's what she said to her. Mommy, if Jesus were to come tonight, I would go. Daddy would go. John would go. Would you be left? How do I know that? I'll tell you how I know it. Because that meeting went over. And they went down to the car and they got the car going and they were coming out of the car park where they were and the car stalled. She ran out of petrol. And when the husband was away getting petrol, came pounding into this woman's mind. I'll be, I'll be left. I'll be left. I'll go in and see the man. I'll go in and see the preacher. But she didn't. So they got going and they were going out to a caravan out near Port Stewart there and going round there at the Metropole, a boy cut out in front of them and nearly cut them in two and the life was scared out of her. Oh, if it happens tonight. They went home or into the caravan. The rain was, was pouring down. And she started to get ready for bed and she couldn't get to bed. I need to see this man. I need to get things right tonight. Please, she said, bring me back. And the troubles were in their height at the time and she came back, her husband and children came back into Port Rush. And she got out of the car and she seen a man on the street, tell me where the police are. And this man knew, he says, they're up there in Castle Aaron. It was my turn that night to lock up the hotel. And I can never, I'll never forget those swinging doors as we were closing them up. This woman was standing outside and even, even the rain was dripping off her. She was weeping. And she told me the story. The wee girl won her for Christ. Ah, she was some friend. And this man Everett's preaching to the children a lifetime, and he's telling them, and they're going home and they're telling their parents, and some of you here tonight, 
and your wee girl strayed. What's wrong with you? What hinders you? Pilots see your Pilots friend and lastly, Pilots folly. He got a basin of water. He washed his hands in a basin of water. How foolish and how stupid can people be? You can't wash your hands of Christ like that. You can't shake this meeting off just like that, you know. You can go and get drunk if you like. You can go for the drugs if you like. You can go to the old telly if you like, but you'll not shake this off. You can't wash your hands of them. Not your hands. It's your heart. He washed his hands in a basin of water. I don't care whether you're sprinkled with it. I don't care whether you're baptized in it. I don't care if you've been drowned in it. Water will never take away your sin. And that's all you have tonight. You're no better than Pilate. A drop of water sprinkled on you. You cannot find cleansing by water. Irene Bradley used to sing. No, no. No, no. It is the blood that maketh the atonement for the soul. It is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, that cleanseth us from all sin. And the night, the day that I got saved, I got saved through that text of Scripture on the last day of May 1970. That was the verse the old uncle read to me. And he, he emphasized E-T-H continually cleanses from all sin. I tell you, it's a mighty thing to be saved. Ah, my friend, of sprinkling or baptizing in water could save your soul. All that our sister had been singing about, we had been singing about, I have been preaching, was in vain. Why did he die? Christ died for the ungodly. Christ Jesus came in to the world to save sinners. What folly. What folly. A Roman Catholic sculptor was dying one day. I read one time he was dying and they held a crucifix up before him. And whether you're a Catholic or a Protestant, my friend, you need Christ. Whether you're an Anglican or a Presbyterian or a Baptist or a Brethren or wherever you put your name, I don't know. But I know that we're all sinners. And they held us crucified, crucifix up before him and said, John, look at it, look at it. He was dying, look at it. He says, there's no use in looking at it, I made it. Nothing in our hands we bring, but simply to the cross we cling. I have to take you to the cross tonight. You've been there from the start of the meeting. And probably when our sister sang, we should have sat down and just cried to God. There's nothing more I can say tonight. You have a friend tonight and he loves you. Maybe a boyfriend, maybe a girlfriend. Maybe a husband, maybe a wife. And they're praying for you, praying to half eleven other night here. Crying unto God. Every man that prayed in that prayer meeting another night or any night there before the meetings, we're praying because we love you. We're friends. Your friend. I want to keep you out of this awful place. Oh, 
Oh, I haven't time tonight and I'm finished now. Roadblock after roadblock has been before you. Gospel tracks, radio programs, children's meetings, godly ministers. And you say like this crowd, I will not have this man to rule over me. That's what you're saying tonight, sinner. Now, come on. I don't care whether he died or suffered. I don't care that they battered him until he couldn't be recognized. I don't care that they clowned him with the thorns and spat in his face. I don't care. I want to do my own thing, and I want to go my own way, and I want to have my own pleasure, and I want to live my own life. Pilate said, what shall I do? That's personal. We're closing in now at the close. What are you going to do? Don't be looking at the one beside you. What are you going to do tonight about what you've heard? What shall I, that's personal. What shall I do? That's positive. You have to do something. What shall I do with Christ, that's powerful because it's a decision you have to make. Choose you. Now, as this meeting closes, what you're going to do with Christ. Because the greatest roadblock of all has been before you from you come into the meeting and that roadblock and the greatest friend of all is the Lord Jesus who hung, spread eagled, naked on that cross with his arms outstretched. Are you going to go past it tonight? Is it nothing to you, all ye that pass by, that there's no sorrow like unto my sorrow? Is it nothing to you? Or is it something to you? Or is it everything to you? Christ died for you. You can't sit on the fence. You have to make a decision. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. On the 3rd of June, 1976, Gunnar Robert Miller, 18 years of age, went in an army patrol to Butcher's Gate, one of the entrances into the bog side in London Derry. To open it. And in a derelict house, not too far away, gunman opened up with a Thompson submachine gun and blew the head of him. I was in the coroner's court when the coroner said the gate was well named. Butcher's Gate. A few months, a few weeks after, I got him home and I got him buried. Those requests came from Glasgow, from his father. I want to see where my son died. He came and stayed in our house in Eglinton with my wife Pat and I for two days. 
And I took them in. And I'll never forget him looking out through the windscreen of the car at the spot where his only son died. And I'll never forget the words, my son, my son. My friend, that doesn't come into reckoning. It's no comparison to what the heart of God must have felt when they kneeled and spat on and crucified and stripped his only son. And all I can say tonight is that I love him with all my heart. And there were a thousand lives I'd given to him. For died he for me, who caused my pain. For me, who him to death pursued. Amazing love. How can it be? That thou, my God, shouldst die for me.